Hi there and welcome to an update on the ongoing geologic unrest in southwest Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Today is February 2nd. It's about 11.30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time here. Uh, about 6.30 p.m. I believe in Iceland. Today we're going to look at some of the latest data. I've got quite a few news stories to share with you and then we'll end up looking at a paper that I just read that might put some of the recent earthquake activity, including an earthquake that happened today in Iceland, maybe put it into a little bit of context. Nothing conclusive, but might provide a little bit of perspective. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, and let's start with the Met Office update. So we had an update from the Icelandic Met Office uh, yesterday and increased chance of eruption. And so let's just run through this brief update and highlight some of the most important things here. Um, so model, so they have been able to estimate and quantify the amount of magma that they believe has accumulated in a shallow subsurface magma chamber uh, underneath and near the Svartsengi power plant. So they were able to approximate that at being 6.5 million cubic meters of magma that underlies that. So that's nice for them to be able to quantify because then they kind of know what they're looking at, especially with the context of the last two eruptions, knowing about how much magma was in that supply system before those eruptions took place. So based on this estimate, it's likely that the magma volume will reach a similar volume as before the January 14th eruption in the next two weeks and even days. This means that the probability of magma flow and eruption has increased. So we're quickly approaching in the next few days to maybe weeks the exact same or very similar magma volume that we had prior to the last eruption, which was on January 14th. Um, moving on, it's not certain that the notice will be as long as in the last eruption. So remember that one had, oh, and they mentioned it right here, there was about five hours notice. So with the January 14th eruption, we had a strong seismic swarm that lasted for about five hours that preceded the actual eruption. Um, remember that on December 18th, it was only about 90 minutes. And so it depends on exactly where that eruption might occur, um, how much of that magma pathway system has been established. That to a large degree dictates the amount of seismic signal and warning we might receive prior to an eruption. If it's taking advantage of a pathway that's well established, it might be a very small amount of earthquake activity in a very short duration of seismic activity. If it's establishing a new pathway, breaking rock along the way, it could be quite a bit longer. Um, let's see, continuing on. In case of repeated magma flows, it's likely that the path for the magma will be easier and this will be accompanied by less seismic activity, which we just talked about. Uh, however, magma flows are always accompanied by increased micro seismic activity and it is most likely there will be a warning for at least one hour on the eve of, of a volcanic eruption which will most likely find its way to the magma tunnel or the dike that formed last November 10th. Uh, seismic activity has been similar to last week. Last week we've had about 200 earthquakes uh, near or around that magma tunnel, that dike. Most of the earthquakes were small, below one in magnitude and at a depth of two to five kilometers running from the Stora Stogafell hill um, and a little south of Hagafelt, which is another topographic hill in that area. Largest earthquake was 1.8. Um, and then an update to the, the hazard map, but uh, largely unchanged for the most part, I suppose. The, the only big change here is them focusing their highest hazard zone on this southern area, just north of the town and uh, up towards Stora Stogafell, this hill up here. So this is the area where they think the eruption is most likely to occur given all the the data we have at this point. So there's the Met Office update looking at earthquakes over the past 24 hours. Uh, we'll get to some of these bigger circles here in a second, but if we focus around uh, Grindavik, we see that, you know, mostly small, 1.7, 1.36, uh, a, a two over here just west of Grindavik um, and mainly at that same depth right around five kilometers depth or so uh, that one's pretty shallow there um, but nothing nothing swarming nothing indicative of 
an earthquake in the short term, although we know this can escalate quickly. So by the time I post this video, this earthquake map can have changed markedly and we could be looking at a possible eruptive event. So, um, but nothing big and swarming just yet. The other bigger uh, news item, I guess, in terms of earthquakes over the last uh, day or two is this 3.2, almost 3.3 that occurred over here in the Krishuvik area. So this is near Lake Klevravatn. And so we had a pretty good sized earthquake here, three. Um, I believe that might have been felt. It's big enough to have been felt regionally, five kilometers depth. Uh, obviously some aftershocks as well. There's a 2.5 and a couple other ones here is, uh, associated with that. Um, again, no data to support these quakes being related to magma moving either up from below this area or over from the area near Grindavik into this region in this system. So these uh, right now look like they probably are tectonic quakes. I wish the um, this website used to show the, the beach balls, the focal mechanism solutions for these quakes and they don't show those anymore and I wish they would because that helps me a little bit with my analysis, but uh, be that as it may, this is the data that we have. Uh, remember a few days ago, we had a few earthquakes and maybe it was a magnitude three or so uh, in this area, southeast of the capital area. And now that area has gone largely fairly quiet. So a few earthquakes here and there to be expected when you're a country on top of a plate boundary, uh, but at least for the last day or so, the main area of focus is the region that's been active and both with earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and this area here which is just showing a few um, elevated levels of earthquakes if we look at earthquakes on the peninsula with the met office data and just look at those over time with this graph down here we can see um, you know pretty much normal background levels of quakes a lull between Thursday into early Friday could be weather related. Not sure if that is, uh, you know, the seismic signal waning or if actually that's the stormy weather affecting the seismometer's ability to detect the smaller quakes. But then you can see a, a strong cluster of quakes here highlighted by that one we talked about in the Krishuvik area that was uh, over magnitude three. And then since then kind of dropping back down a little bit to um, more or less what we've seen over the past few weeks. Um, GPS data. So GPS data, I'll just show you a few of these. And again, the links for all of these are in the video description. So if you want to dig into the data yourself, uh, spend some time with it, go for it. That'd be great. But this is the Svartsengi station. And so we're mainly focusing on this is uh, this is the north south movement over time. And this goes back to early November. There's the November 10th. December 18th and January 14th events. Uh, two of these were eruptions. The last two were eruptions. The November 10th event uh, was a near eruption. The magma got very close to the surface. It injected into a new region uh, off to the east of the power plant, but it did not culminate in an eruption. But you can clearly see those events showing up on the GPS signal. So this blue line shows movement of the site of the GPS station uh, over time. So anytime the blue line shifts up, that's a movement to the north. If it goes down, it's to the south. The middle plot with the green dots is east-west motion. So moving up is movement to the west. And when it drops down, that's movement. Oh, excuse me. No, it's movement to the east when it goes up. Sorry. And then when it drops down, it's movement to the west. So this station over time, over the last three months, has moved to the north and a bit to the west as well. And then the last one here is the up-down motion. So just purely up-down motion. Um, it dropped because a lot of the magma moved and injected into shallow levels off to the east on November 10th. Since that time, continued magma influx into the region has caused it to rise, the ground actually up being uplifted and rising. And that culminated with the December 18th eruption and then we have another one here January 14th, but the curious thing at this station was you don't see the down drop in the data. And so presumably either it erupted magma that wasn't part of this supply under the power plant or the supply uh, was more or less keeping pace with the amount being erupted. But the main thing is since that time we can see 
this continuing to increase. It looks like it's leveled off a little bit, um, but then there's a little bit of an upturn here at the, at the very end of this data. So it kind of ebbs and flows a little bit. That's somewhat typical of these inflationary, deflationary systems as more magma supplied and depending on how the rocks and the crust respond to that. This is a station, this is the Elvorp station, so this is a few kilometers to the west of the power plant and a little bit south as well. Again, November 10th, December 18th, and January 14th. But interestingly, this one, um, with those last two eruptions, we had a pretty consistent elevation that this station got to or achieved before the eruptions took place. And now as we look at the most recent data, I believe if we're a little bit past that. So the elevations have, have slightly increased over what the elevations were at the time of those eruptions. So it'd be interesting to see how much further some of these stations can go in terms of uplift before uh, an eruption takes place. And then the last one I threw in here, I just grabbed a few that I thought were kind of interesting. They added a GPS station at the Blue Lagoon or very close to the Blue Lagoon following all the, the chaos and uh, activity in November and so in this one you can see uh, when the station goes online the December 18th eruption uh, the station rising January 14th eruption and now you can see it well past those both those states at each eruption it's been able to uplift a little higher so you can see the December 18th trigger point was higher than December January 14th was higher than December 18th and now where we are today at the early February, it's higher than it was for January 14th. The other interesting thing is you can see a little bit of a dip or maybe it's flatlining a little bit with the error bars there, but a lull. And then, but the last three or four data points here um, are quite a steep trend out here uh, in this area. So worth monitoring. But the, the bottom line in looking at all this G GPS and earthquake data is it seems like the, the the system is primed. It seems like an eruption could take place any day now. Um, I think the clock started ticking at least for, by all accounts for at least for for my, my monitoring and what I was looking at maybe about a week ago and now that could go on for a couple more weeks. Um, and so remember this is just the earth has its own timeline. It's not in a hurry. Um, we're of course humans and we live in this very kind of fast-paced give it to me now, self-satisfying, quick gratification type of world. So who knows when uh, that eruption will take place. But we do want to talk a little bit about the effects on the town here. So let's turn to a couple of the news stories, um, starting with the science and then turning a little bit more towards the human element. I'll make sure I put all these news links in the video description if you want to peruse these on your own. Um, so this one here kind of reiterates some of the information we received from the Met Office, um, but just reiterating that the chances of an eruption has increased. Uh, talks a little bit about the, the warning time between the uh, uptick in earthquake activity and when the eruption took place, that that was as short as 90 minutes with the December eruption, and it was about five hours with the January eruption. Uh, and then they talk a little bit about the total number of earthquakes there. So not a lot uh, new in that article, um, but I thought I'd throw it in there just for fun. Um, this is one here, and, and thanks as always to uh, Amanda Joe, who has a house in Grindavik and who has been instrumental in supplying the the data and the the news, a lot of the information I'm able to relay to you. She's there in Iceland and is able to send that to me um, and, and that's very helpful because I probably wouldn't be able to navigate all the Icelandic news sites and, and deal with some of the translation issues if she wasn't doing that. So uh, as always, a, a proper shout out to her. But this one's interesting. One of their national or natural disaster experts uh, believes that the next eruption is most likely between Stora Stogafell and Hagafelt. And so as a quick just uh, geography reminder, here's the town. And so he thinks that the eruption is going to take place between these two hills right in here. Uh, and as always, I, I read these articles from their scientists and I, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't dispute anything they say uh, in terms of respecting them and their credentials. But oftentimes, at least in the stories, there's just nothing 
that justifies some of their statements or their conclusions. And so that's always um, the hard part f from my perspective. I've noticed um, in looking, and you know, maybe he's looking at the, the seismic data. Um, Stora Stogafelt is up here. Um, and so we haven't seen a lot of seismic activity in this region. Remember the December 18th eruption was right about in this area. Uh, and then the January eruption shifted further south. It was more or less near this hill Hagafelt. So he's picking between these two areas as a likely place for the next eruption. Um, I think in just looking at the seismic signals, which is just one avenue of data, uh, that it's definitely seen that along this northeast southwest trend that the earthquakes have been more towards the south half of that system as opposed to the north half. Uh, and so I'm not disputing what he says. It's just always interesting to me um, why they think that. Um, he points out that the magma tunnel reaches to the north of Stora Stogafelt and south of Hagafelt. Therefore, it is not excluded that an eruption may arise further south and even stretch in the direction of Grindavik. However, it's not likely. As for whether an eruption could take place inside Grindavik, he says no. It's not likely it will erupt inside the town. And in fact, the geologic data does not indicate that. But nothing's out of the question, so we have to keep it as a possibility. So. I don't know, some reporting, it almost is a little contradictory there because it says that he says no, but then he kind of qualifies it as saying it's possible. So um, not sure. It's always interesting reading some of these because you never know how much of the language being translated is, is maybe shifting the narrative one way or the other. Um, anyway, so and then he just says we have to wait and see. Lots of uncertainty as to what the notice will be, which I would completely agree with. Um, we're in the wait and see mode for sure. Uh, looking at the town in Grindavik, this article just talks about that the damage, especially <clears throat> in the eastern part of the town, uh, has become a lot worse. And remember that when we look at the town, that we also had these two grobins or down-dropped areas bounded by faults. That's what the solid lines are. The teal line to the on the left here to the west, that formed on November 10th. And this blue one here uh, is the newest one. And so this area between these these darker blue lines is where they're seeing a lot of the worst damage in town popping up. And so this article uh, discusses just some of these cracks getting bigger. Some of the houses are more damaged. Um, it just seems to be that that part of town is is looking a little bit worse than than any other part. Um, Amanda Joe sent this to me as well. This is a, and this is hopefully good news for the residents of Grindavik. So they're putting forth a bill into their their government or parliament, into the political political governing system there, that will uh, provide a, a financial settlement for those people, those homeowners in Grindavik. And so hopefully that bill is, um, from what I've heard from Amanda Joe, it's it's probably as good as it could be in terms of how favorable it is in giving them a pretty fair value on their house. So hopefully that goes through so that those people can move on with their lives and, and maybe have some sense of closure. Um, but she did also let me know that people that want to keep their houses uh, can, I believe, that they can choose to not sell their house to the government. So they do have that option, which is which is nice. Um, this was kind of a sad little story here. So one of the main businesses in Grindavik is this uh, fishing um, business. So they have the boats that goes out and catches the fish. Then they bring the fish back and process the fish and package it and, and send it out to various areas for consumption. Uh, and this family run business that's been there since 1988, I believe, they had to lay off uh, 47 employees um, just it just wasn't working out. They, I think they received some government help for a while, but I think for them looking forward at the present and into the future, uh, it just wasn't going to be uh, feasible for them to keep those employees on and keep the business running as it has in the past. And so obviously a very difficult decision because they built that business up uh, on the backs of their employees. And so I'm sure that was, that was a tough one there. And um, so just wanted to bring that up. Um, Another kind of not so positive story, I suppose, is that the rescue uh, emergency personnel and 
other staff that they've been using at like the checkpoints around Grenindavik and keeping the town secure and um, places around the berm and where the roads are closed, they've had trouble with staffing some of those positions um, that it's been really tricky getting those positions filled, um, especially when, you know, there's no end in sight that, you know, that it's, I'm sure it's long hours. I'm sure it's stressful conditions are out there in the winter weather. Uh, and so as you might expect, it's been a difficult, um, difficult task getting those positions filled. So little story there on that. Uh, and then let's get to, this is where I want to take the rest of our time together is looking at the earthquake. Uh, well, two earthquakes really. So we had the earthquake today uh, over here near in the Krishuvik system. This is this other volcanic system over here. And then if you've been watching the updates from the last uh, few days, uh, I can't remember what day it was, but it was earlier this week, I believe there was an earthquake southeast of the capital area in this region here. Some people in Reykjavik and other outlying communities actually felt the earthquake. Um, and so let's let's go through a couple articles here and then I want to provide a little bit of perspective on this that, that might help a little bit. Um, and so the area that shook near the capital is this area here, Blafjot. Um, and so she says we, we should totally pay attention. This is the Met Office director. Totally pay attention there that it's an area that's had historic seismicity. It's an area that's had earthquakes in the past. Um, it's close enough to the capital area that it warrants monitoring. Um, but she also states in here, there's no signs of magma accumulation in the area, which I think is our natural gut reaction is, okay, we just had an eruption. We've had five eruptions in three years in, on the peninsula. And so anytime there's a few earthquakes, an earthquake that's felt, I won't even call it an earthquake swarm, a cluster of earthquakes. I think that's the natural um, place to jump to in a lot of people's minds. And I want to provide, and I'm not saying that it isn't, but there's no evidence for magma moving into that region. And as a scientist myself, uh, until we see evidence or indicators, I'll say it's possible, but I'm not, that's not the, the hypothesis I would put out right now at this time without that evidence being there. Um, and this is a similar article about just, you know, that the country should be prepared for earthquakes, that there was, uh, in that region, there was um, that area, large earthquakes about magnitude six occur once about every 50 years. There was one in 1968 and before that in 1929. Uh, realize, of course, that's only two data points. So we don't want to um, project a earthquakes recurrence interval based on two data points. That's not so good, but it does let us know that, hey, like this is a region where there's earthquakes. Earthquakes can occur of this magnitude. And so you should be prepared. It doesn't mean that we're going to get another earthquake there every 40 or 50 years per se. Um, okay, and so that leads me to the last thing here. Oh, one last thing I had real quick before we get to some, some of the science stuff. I wanted to, um, and I hope she's okay with me doing this, but our good friend Amanda Jo let, just let me know right before coming on here that she, uh, her family, they had been looking at a house down here at this town called Stockseri. Um, and so they found a house that just fits perfectly for them and their pets and they put an offer in on it. And she, of course, you know, as I'm sure a lot of you been in this situation was very optimistic and trying not to get her hopes up too high. But of course, you know, at, at some point you feel like, oh, I, I really hope we, this works out and we get this house. This would be a great situation. They have friends in the area. There's already a good sense of community there. Uh, and she just let me know that their offer was accepted. So, so that's great news. Um, it's, Great news on multiple fronts. One that hopefully this bill passes and that will help them provide a lot of the the funds that they need to to move their family and uh, to this new community and, and get into that house. So so congratulations to Amanda Joe. That's that's great great news. Hopefully it, all the other pieces continue to fall in place. Uh, so I want to end up this update here. Whatever I do these updates, I'm constantly trying to learn. Uh, like you. And so I found a paper, I usually try to find a paper or some little science article or section of a textbook, something that can help me understand the 
Icelandic geology a little bit better so that when I provide these updates to you, uh, you feel like you're get, you're learning along with me because that's the whole intent here and that you're, you know, you're that we're going through this together and you're getting the best information that I can share. I'm going to make mistakes. I've, I've made mistakes in the past. I'll always try to correct those when I know I've misspoken or stated something incorrect. I'll always try to make amends for that. Um, but here's an article. This is from 2006. Uh, structural architecture of a highly oblique divergent plate boundary segment. So um, I'll put a link to this if you want to dive into it. But what I found really interesting about this article, and remember that we have these these systems, right? There's these uh, there's five or six, depending on how you count them, volcanic systems that run through the Reykjanes Peninsula. We've got the Reykjanes system at the southwest tip. Uh, the Edvorp and Svartsengi systems, sometimes those are divided, sometimes those are lumped together, but that's the system that's erupting or is, is causing uh, so much of the activity we're seeing lately. Uh, there's the Krishuvik system, which is over here by the big lake. That's the one that had a few earthquakes uh, today. Uh, the Blafjot system, which also had a few earthquakes uh, earlier in the week. And then the Hengil system. All of these areas are have been volcanically active in the past. They all have, for the most part, I think this is true, they all have uh, a shallow, hot groundwater geothermal system. There's a power plant here. There's the Svartsengi power plant. Uh, I don't know if there's a power plant near Krishuvik, but there's a geothermal area with hot springs and uh, mud pots. Um, and then I know for sure over here, as you're driving over this way, there's another uh, geothermal power plant as you're heading towards Clara uh, Gerdi and Selfos. I believe that's part of this one here. So my point is that these are known volcanic systems, but let's also remember that in addition to being volcanic systems, these are also tectonic or fault systems. That This is a plate boundary we're dealing with. And if you head into any part of the area here in this part of Iceland, and just zoom way in, um, you're going to see a couple things. You're going to see most likely lava flows. You're going to see fracture systems in the ground, some of which are volcanic fractures or fissures. Lava came out of those vents. Uh, in other places, though, you're just going to see fracture systems that aren't related to volcanic systems. That are just cracks or faults in the ground that have formed because of the this plate boundary that's here. And so this paper, I thought it was just a good reminder to me, and maybe I'll pull it out here. I've got a couple things written down. Um, a couple things I can highlight in, in this paper as we kind of run through it. And yeah, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you. That would put you right to sleep, but a few things here. So clusters of fractures comprised of shear fractures and tension fractures are closely associated with the volcanic fissure swarms. Okay, so a lot of those are related to or associated with that. Um, and then moving on, let's see at the bottom here, um, just looking at the paper I printed and what things I highlighted. Uh, a significant number of strike slip faults, so that's faults that move sideways, laterally, side to side, are also present, but the relationship to the fissure swarms is unclear as they lie in a zone trending nearly east-west across the rest of the peninsula. So basically what they've done here, if you get through their methods, is they uh, got a lot of really good aerial photos and digital elevation models um, and really looked at the landscape in very fine detail and looked at these fractures and then figured out and plotted them up exactly where they are. And they found that there's some, it looks chaotic, but there actually are sets or what they're calling domains of fractures. So here in different colors, red, yellow, green, blue, and purple are the fractures uh, that they could spot using their imagery on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Here's the capital area here. Uh, Grindavik is down in this area here, I believe. And they were able to kind of plot these up into different domains. So you can see in red, these are mostly kind of north-south trending fractures. As you get into the yellows and greens, those trend northeast-southwest at different angles. Then there's some blue ones in here you might be able to pick out that are more, um, more east-west-ish anyway. Uh, and then there's even some purple ones down here as well. 
Um, let me get to some of the discussion points they had here. These are a couple pages later. Um, so my whole point in this is that, yes, these are volcanic systems, but they're also tectonic systems. Um, and so when we get earthquakes anywhere on the Reykjanes Peninsula, I don't think it's always a good idea to assume that it's driven by magma intrusions. Um, I think if you look at the number of fractures and faults, cracks in the ground, uh, and how many of them actually erupt, I think you'd see that most of them are tectonic structures rather than volcanic structures. And that's what they've done here a little bit too, is now they've broken those four groups of colored fractures down, outlined the five volcanic systems, and then plotted the fractures on top of that to see what kind of relationships they have. Um, and so, and so what we call this, the fancy word we use here is when the, the stress of an area imposed by the plate boundary, um, whenever we look at how that's being distributed across different structures, that's sometimes called strain partitioning. How is that, that strain, how is that deformed rock being manifested in the rocks themselves. What kind of fractures are forming? How are they oriented? How long are they? How wide uh, of an opening is there? If there is even an opening, how much movement on the fault systems are there? What kinds of faults are there? Um, and that's sort of the idea. And so just a couple of things from their discussion. So here they talk about, uh, right here, so lots of things are controlling these fractures and faults. Uh, the ridge obliquity, basically the direction that the plate is spreading is not perpen perpendicular to all of those fracture systems. Uh, the proximity to the ridge axis, proximity to volcanic centers, how often magma accumulates, what they're calling magmatic periodicity, um, and associated temporal variability in the stress and strain fields changes in rift orientation, reactivation of old structures, and the development of fractures in locally perturbed stress fields. Lots of lingo there, but basically there's a lot of different factors that are controlling these fracture and fault systems on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Um, volcanic fissure swarms on the peninsula have an orientation about 35 degrees counterclockwise to the strike of the presumed ridge axis. So that's kind of interesting. It doesn't even actually parallel it directly. It's a little bit uh, off of it. Um, nonetheless, the strike of fractures, that's the direction that they go. That's what strike means. The fractures within these fissure swarms is highly variable and thus difficult to attribute to a single cumulative strain direction. So it's pretty complicated, all these different fractures in all these different directions. Um, however, they do note that magmatism okay, is, an import, is important for fracture pattern development. However, magmatic episodes on the peninsula are periodic with a post-glacial repeat time on the order of a thousand years. So what they're saying is, hey, magma moving into the subsurface is totally important to generating these fracture systems. However, there's episodes when there's no magmatic movement taking place, no eruptions taking place. So that can't be the dominant uh, factor in generating these fault and fracture systems. Uh, in fact, spreading centers are in general characterized by periodic magmatic episodes and variable magma production rates. Such complexities are not incorporated uh, into our models. Da, 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 da. Anyway, so just some things there. Uh, if, all, if all fractures developed only during magmatic periods, it might be expected that the strike of fractures would be fairly uniform and similar to that of the eruptive fissures. But then they talk about how kind of crazy and chaotic they are a little bit. Um, uh, fractures strike differ from those within the swarms and thus cannot be directly linked to the effect of dike intrusion. Um, I am sort of cherry picking some of the statements here, of course, and I'm not downplaying um, the amount of the effects of the magmatic component. I just think it's, it's important for us maybe to have a little bit of clarity on just how important the tectonic stresses are in generating these earthquakes. Uh, last little bit here and then I'll conclude this. Um, their conclusions. Uh, they talk about some of the same things, factors that, c that pr produce all these different fault orientations. The most active fault set at any point in time is variable. So the faults that are slipping and generating earthquakes um, in terms of direction or mechanism, it's 
different all the time. Strike slip faulting dominates during amagmatic periods, so periods where there isn't magmatism. And of course, this was published in 2006 before some of the unrest took place over the last three years. Whereas normal faulting is more prominent during magmatic periods. Nonetheless, normal faults are somewhat active in non-magmatic periods. Uh, so anyway, there's, there's a lot to unpack here, but um, I think my big takeaway from this, if I had to kind of sum it all up, is this. Um, so the recent quakes we see in this area, like these here, the ones uh, over here near Krišovic, they may be related to magmatic movement. I am totally putting that on the table as a very viable hypothesis. Could these earthquakes here and the ones we had earlier in the week southeast of the capital area, could those earthquakes be connected to what's happening near Grindavik? I'm totally okay with that being a possibility, but I think it's, um, it's a little bit dangerous maybe to jump to that conclusion. And I wonder if collectively we all have a little bit of a bias in our thinking in that we've had five eruptions here in the last three years. So whenever we see or hear about these earthquake clusters anywhere somewhat close, our brain goes to volcanoes and eruptions. Whereas I wonder if all this was taking place and it was, let's say, 2016, like uh, eight years ago, would we be thinking in that vein um, if, if we were back at that year? You know, if we didn't have the recency bias of five eruptions and Grindavik being evacuated, would we associate these earthquake clusters as being possible, um, possibly related to magmatic movement and possibly indicative of a future eruption? I don't know. Just food for thought there. Um, but hope, I think what I was trying to do is maybe back down some of the narrative, maybe some of the media hype, um, you know, cool the temperature down a little bit. These earthquakes are happening, they mean something, but my brain as a geologist, given these earthquakes, lo their location, um, first goes to tectonic s stresses and faulting versus magma intruding and a possible eruption. So, but we'll have to see how it all plays out. So uh, thanks for sticking with me. This was a little bit longer. I had the paper I wanted to get through and we had lots of news items as well. I'll of course try to keep you abreast of any of the new developments as they come in. We are pretty much primed here in Iceland and you know, really everything seems to be in place where an eruption could occur at any point. Uh, I'm also trying to split time between this one in the Atlantic Ocean and Kilauea in the Pacific over in Hawaii and monitoring that place as well. So for now, we'll go ahead and sign off. Thanks for your encouragement, support, for your uh, enthusiasm, comments, everything you're able to share with me. I hope this helps a little bit. I hope you're able to learn with me uh, and we can both grow and become better moving forward. So we'll just sign off from now and we'll see you next time on another update. Thank you.